Hello, everyone. I think that's actually the biggest crowd of people that I've seen being interested about security. <laughs> so thanks. Um, my name is Oliver. I'm the co-founder and CEO of PatchTech. Um, a little bit about my background. I've been working in WordPress since 2014 when I was running a web development company which was focused on WordPress, actually about web application security in general, but we very much so focused on uh, WordPress from the early days already. Uh, I'm also an active community builder, so in Estonia where I live, I've also co-founded a co-working space which has turned into a startup center uh, in our town. And I've also been organizing hacking events, which is called uh, Capture the Flag competitions, where hackers are uh, challenging each other and competing uh, against each other. So we've been doing it for NATO and different kind of organizations. Um, today, I'll mostly use your time uh, to give you a little bit of an overview of what we've seen over the past couple of years in the WordPress security space. Uh, I will dive into a little bit into numbers, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about what are the biggest challenges that we've seen that uh, need to be uh, hopefully solved or improved. Um, I will then, then share what are the uh, expectations for this year, something that we've already seen this year, but what we should expect uh, in this year and beyond. And then dive into like what we as a community could do to make WordPress ecosystem even more secure than it is today. So let's start with the very good news. I think WordPress ecosystem is more secure than it has ever been before. If we look at the data from the past years, in 2020, there was 541 security vulnerabilities disclosed in the entire WordPress ecosystem. That includes plugins, themes, WordPress core, everything is included. In 2021, this number jumped to 1,382. And last year, in 2022, this number skyrocketed into 4,528 security vulnerabilities. What's important to mention here is the fact that these vulnerabilities are not like they just popped up this year uh, on, on those years and like they've never been existing there before. This is kind of like, you can expect it like a backlog of security vulnerabilities that are getting fixed from all these previous years because they have actually existed there for many, many years. So now we're finally like cleaning up the backlog of security issues within the plugins and themes and in the WordPress uh, ecosystem in general. So that's a really good thing because now, you know, the bad actors, the, the hackers who would otherwise exploit these issues have, you know, much less issues to find because the plugin developers have already fixed them, and teams as well. Out of those 4,500 security bugs that were disclosed in 2022, 99.7% were actually found in plugins and themes. Um, most of them, like most of these issues, as you can see, are from the plugins and themes, and only 26 of those in total were actually from the WordPress core. And the good thing about this is that those issues that were fixed in the WordPress core itself, we never seen any of them actually be actively exploited. What it means is that the WordPress as a platform itself is very mature. It has a very mature uh, you know, release cycle. It has a very good attention on security. And the issues that are found in the core are mostly so low severity that they're not really useful for anyone to even exploit. That's not the true, unfortunately, with the plugins and themes. Um, if we look into 2022 in terms of the data that we saw in all the vulnerabilities that were reported within this year, actually, we saw a little bit of a shift in the vulnerabilities that were uh, disclosed. And there is a reason for it, which is actually on the next slide, but before I get to it, I will give you a little bit of insight into what those vulnerabilities look like. So cross-site request forgery, which is on top of the, one, uh, on top of the list, is something that you actually trick a, let's say, admin user into clicking your link that directs them into the page where they are like tricked into, let's say, clicking an option or changing some option on your website. Then there is cross-site scripting vulnerabilities where a you know, malicious code can be injected into the website so the visitor loads it and you will basically see the website then loading something that shouldn't be there. This is one of the most common vulnerabilities that is being exploited. 
And then we have actually one that is very important to mention is the broken access control, where the plugins don't necessarily maybe use the WordPress hooks in the correct way. I, I think many of you have heard about the ease admin function, which a lot of people are actually confusing in terms of what it does. But one of the issues with the broken access control is that the, the, the plugins may be having unauthentic, un, unauthenticated access to a function that should only be available for authenticated users. And in that case, you know, attackers can either you know, turn on registration, make the, re make the registered users admins by default, and you know, all that kind of crazy stuff. The reason why the cross-site request forgery, which is actually the lowest ranking fruit you can find in the WordPress ecosystem, was on the top one position, is actually the, the issue in the software supply chain or the security of the uh, so software supply chain. How you can think about that is like websites, like all our websites use some level of plugins. And you know, if a plugin has a vulnerability that releases a patch, for example, you will go there and get it patched and you update the plugin, right? Now, what if the plugins themselves also use plugins. And you know, then what it means is that the plugin that the, um, the plugin that or the framework or library that was used within the plugin is getting a security issue fixed, then all the plugins that actually use this framework also need to go and update. And then eventually if they do, then the, then the end user needs to go and update uh, you know, uh, plugin on the website. And like with each additional layer, we are actually adding delay for the end users to get protected. And that's a really big challenge in the space right now. And the last year, the number actually spiked because there was two big frameworks that were actually used within thousands of plugins. Uh, and they shared then eventually the common security vulnerabilities. It's actually also very hard to, secure, to report security issues to plugins. Um, to give you a little bit of context behind this chart that you're seeing on the screen, what we do at PatchTech is running a program called PatchTech Alliance. It's a community of ethical hackers who report security vulnerabilities in any of the plugins in the ecosystem, and they are getting rewarded for that. They're getting rewarded because they are using ethical processes to make sure that the plugin developers have all the necessary information to fix a security vulnerability before it's being found by someone else with much worse uh, motivations, let's say. So 1,160 security vulnerabilities, unique security vulnerabilities, were reported last year into the Patch Tech Alliance program. Out of those 1,160, uh, there were 748 that were accepted by us, which we validated, made sure that they are the correct issues, that there was enough information about that so that the plugin developer could fix it. And then, you know, a big portion of them got patched. Even though it takes a lot of effort to actually reach out to the plugin developers, because very often you can't find any information on their website, you can't find information on their forms. Even if they do have a form, then very often you just get like an error message saying that, whoops, that form is not working. So you, have, you basically have like a black hole where you're putting your, uh, your security reports and you never get the reply. On the other hand, you have those security, security researchers and ethical hackers who are waiting for you know, hearing back when are those vulnerabilities getting resolved? So here, who is actually helping us out a lot, and I think we should give a big applause to the WordPress.org plugin review team, because they have been done like amazing job in terms of how much they have actually dealt with those issues. So really, come on guys, it's, yeah. So the plugin review team is helping us when we need to escalate security issues to them to make sure that the end users will eventually get the information that they need to patch the, to update the plugins that are vulnerable. And from those 748 issues, 148 uh, cases were actually escalated to the plugins team. And what they've done is then they tried to reach out to those plugins again as well. And if they can't do so, then they are going to close the plugin. Now, what is a scary part here is that over 10% of those you know, cases, they actually remain closed, which means that the plugins are still, to this date, actually closed down. You, if you go to the WordPress.org repo, you can see that the plugin is closed for security reasons or, if, you know, in, in some level of that, in that kind of message. Now, if 10% of these vulnerabilities that are getting escalated, how many plugins actually are there that are abandoned, that the developer doesn't respond to, and how many of how many websites there are that are running those plugins that are not maintained by anyone anymore and you know, are basically vulnerable, but without, having, without the website owner having any information about that. So 
This is a big issue, actually. So way too many security bugs are not getting patched. Actually, last year, 26% of critical security bugs were not receiving a timely patch at all. That means that these critical security issues are the, usually the ones that are unauthenticated, the attackers can you know, run mass exploitation campaigns to take over a website, inject malware, um, and do pretty much whatever they want, right? So 20, 26% is a big number. So even if you have like auto-updates enabled, you know, you're not really you know, protected in any way because you just don't get an update. So even though those plugins get removed from WordPress.org, they still stay on websites. And even worse, so closed plugins have no indicator of active security issues on the WordPress admin panel. That's a big issue because if you look at the WordPress.org repository, you actually see that the plugin is closed for security issues. But now, who is actually, you know, who should know about this issue the most is the site owners, the ones that are actually running the WordPress website where they see the list of plugins that they have installed. But to this date, WordPress core itself doesn't have an indicator within the admin panel that would tell you that, hey, you're running this you know, plugin on your website, but this, isn't, this is closed by the WordPress.org repo repository, and it's not you know, actively maintained anymore. That brings me to something that just happened very recently. Uh, I was speaking at CloudFest last year, uh, sorry, earlier this year, and I was talking about this issue as well. So we actually found uh, an old, eight-year-old ticket in the WordPress, uh, you know, in, in, basically a feature request to add an alert into the WordPress admin panel to show the user that the plugin is removed from the WordPress you know, uh, repository for the security reasons. So there's a QR code link to that uh, entry. So if anyone wants to kind of share their ideas or kind of like add additional information to that, please do so, because I think this is a very big thing that we should look into and have maybe a bit more of a deeper conversation around to make the WordPress ecosystem much more secure. So let's look into what else we could do as a whole community to make WordPress more secure. I think we need to accept that it's OK for projects to come to an end. I think it's OK when we build plugins and we build projects in general and we eventually come to a conclusion that maybe, it's not, maybe it wasn't used by anyone that much that you were expecting, or maybe it didn't go as well as you expected as well. But if you build a plugin, then you need to kind of keep in mind that other people might still be using it. So I think it's very important to communicate very transparently and let the users know whenever you are planning to maybe you know, drop the project or like move on to additional things. What you could also do, for example, is you know, reach out to the community, talk to people on post status, for example, ask maybe someone wants to take this plugin over, maybe someone else wants to maintain it in the future. And I think another thing that we might want to think about is maybe it's okay to send an end-of-life date until the users receive security patches. Let them know that, hey, I'm planning to move to other things, so here's a date until I'm actually you know, getting the security patches if there's anything you know, needing to get patched, but I'm not adding additional, secu uh, additional features to the plugin, so I'm not, you know. Then the users will get some level of kind of time when they can find alternatives and figure out how to move forward. And please, <laughs> Don't reject security reports because you've moved on. On the top corner, you are actually seeing uh, an interaction by our security team with a plugin developer. Uh, I think it happened last month where we reported a security issue to them. It was a serious issue which actually needed the patch quite quickly. And the only response we got from there is that, sorry, we no longer maintain this plugin. This plugin currently has over 100,000 active installations. So again, this is a problem and we don't know how many of these situations actually are there even more in the ecosystem. And I think we need, as a whole community, to talk about that a little bit more to make the entire ecosystem more secure. Another thing that what we, and it kind of like applies to the previous talk where we, uh, to the previous slide where we reach out to the developer and saying, hey, there's a security issue, you know, we could help you fix it, is then please don't, you know, avoid security research as all. Well. What we've seen over the past years is that in many cases where security reporter or security researchers report the vulnerability to a plugin, they are kind of like, you know, reacted with negativity, you know, why you are like looking into our stuff and, you know, who asked you to check our plugin and, you know, that kind of stuff. So one thing that we should, I think, look into is 
considering security researchers as equal contributors as our developers. When, you, when a developer is submitting nice code into your plugin, into your open source project, you're actually happy, right? So why shouldn't you be super happy and thankful to security researchers who point out in your code base to places where you can improve and also provide a better product to your customers? So plugins actually, thanks to the security researchers in the space, plugins can fix vulnerabilities before bad actors can exploit those zero days. So from the past years, we see this you know, increasing number of security vulnerabilities being uh, you know, fixed and reported. These are all the vulnerabilities less for the bad guys, right? So it's good. So it's good for everyone. It's good for the community. It's good for the you know, open source project uh, maintainers. And really, think of researchers as the good hackers on your side. I think we, like, if anyone gives you, a, you like an op, uh, option, like, do you want the hackers to be on your side or do you want the hackers to be on, you know, on the other side, which one would you pick? I think it's a pretty simple you know, uh, option to choose. And I think we need to think about that in the sense of incentivizing the security researcher and the good hackers to be on our side and not on the other side. So I've talked a lot about like, you know, plugins ecosystem and teams ecosystem and the projects in general, but like I imagine in this room, there's also people who just maybe build websites or have their own website built. So what should you do uh, you know, in the light of all this information? I think it's more and more important to choose the, your you know, stack wisely and keep plugins to minimum. It's a very common you know, security recommendation, but it's very important and I think it's still not praised enough. I think it's very much easier to choose a stack or you know, a selection of tools that you like to use, like select your favorite page builder, select your favorite you know, forms plugin, select your favorite you know, tools that you in general build the websites with. And if you're a developer building websites to a lot of different customers, try to stick to that stack. Because when a security vulnerability is being found, then you actually have much smaller um, attack surface. Like if you use like hundreds or 200 different plugins across all your websites, you would probably need to deal with security vulnerabilities every single day. That's a fact. So another thing to look into is the WordPress-specific firewall, something that is actually being able to detect whether there are vulnerabilities on your website and to actually provide you a very targeted protection for those vulnerabilities, something that is called nowadays as a virtual patching, which means that the vulnerability is being found on your website and it receives a security rule exactly for that vulnerability. I think it's very important because what you, are, what you receive then is to actually keep in mind that 20, I mentioned just 26% of the security or like the critical issues from 2022 uh, were uh, not patched. So what virtual patching actually gives you is the time to stay protected until the developer releases a patch, or it gives you a little bit more time to go there and update your website. So it's definitely an essential thing looking into the light of you know, how much of those security vulnerabilities are out there and you know, how big is the chance that you might end up with one as well. And really, choose a good hosting service that lets you know about vulnerabilities as well, because there's a lot of hosting companies who actually do that. So we have you know, managed hosting providers who have like a panel where you see all you know, plugins that you have installed and everything. A lot of the hosting providers nowadays actually also include the information whether any of those plugins include a you know, security vulnerability. So ask this from your hosting company or choose a hosting company that already does security out of the box and helps you to at least be aware of those security issues. So what to expect from 2023? So a lot more ethical hackers will get interested in WordPress. That's for a fact because WordPress has a huge impact and there's so many different plugins and themes and you know, so many different projects to look for security issues. So nowadays we have also like, you know, bug bounty programs and different programs which incentivize the ethical hackers to report security vulnerabilities more ethically. And you know, obviously if we have more ethical hackers you know, get interested in WordPress, we will see a lot more vulnerabilities to be reported and patched as well. Not only because of you know, if we have more ethical hackers on board and we get more vulnerabilities reported and patched, but also uh, plugin developers themselves and you know, team developers and project owners they actually put much more effort into security as well. Last year, we saw an uptick actually of uh, projects getting security audits, setting up security programs for their plugins, and, and so forth. 
I won't even start mentioning AI here because everyone is doing that. So, but you know, you can kind of also think about that line of things because we do have a lot of tools available that would help you know ethical hackers to also find vulnerabilities more easily in the plugins. Um, and all that taken into consideration, what we need to again keep in mind is that if 10% from the last year, there was 10% of the plugins that remain closed after the security reports being reported to them, we're probably going to see that number increase as well. As a final note here, I actually want to also mention something that is upcoming over the upcoming years, is that governments start to regulate open source security uh, and supply chain security as well. So if public sector and enterprises need to stay compliant, they need to understand what kind of open source you know, uh, tools they rely on, you know, what kind of open source projects they actually even use, what kind of you know, plugins they are running on their you know, infrastructure, um, what is the security status of those, then developers and agencies who provide services to them need also to kind of you know, provide that kind of overview, insight, and security services. So this is something that you know, the developers and agencies in the space already need to think about, is that a lot of those you know, larger enterprises and public sector customers will start asking, hey, why did you, you, why did you choose that stack when you know, starting to build our application? And what, does that, you know, what kind of risk might come with that if we rely on that kind of open source software? Um, and this also brings higher security expectations toward plugin developers because if, if, if developers and the agencies need to start choosing the stack more wisely and making sure that they have like a good overview of like how, how well it's maintained, what are the previous security issues, how well they are, how fast are they actually fixing security issues if they're reported, how well is it communicated and so forth, then what we are going to see is that you know, plugin developers will have higher expectations as well. And to be honest, I think plugin developers have the most to win from here. I think what they can do is set up you know, security programs, maybe even incentivize the, the ethical hackers to report vulnerabilities to them to make sure that they are more actively looking for vulnerabilities in their software, set up a bounty program. I think this is all in benefit for the plugin developers right now because the developers who will use your product, they will trust you more. So I think the key takeaways here really is that Right now, the WordPress ecosystem is more secure than ever. I'm looking forward to say the exact same thing next year, and then year again, and then year again. Um, I think plugin developers have a lot to win here, and as a community, I think plugin developers have also the most to do in terms of making the WordPress space more secure. And yeah, if you want to see the data from which I actually used on the talk from the last year, and a little bit even more data than the QR code actually sends you there. Um, and thank you all for making the WordPress space so much secure. And thank you. And thank you, Oliver, for sharing. Um, while we, so just so you know, we have the standing mics there. If you have uh, questions, we have time for questions. Um, while we are waiting people to uh, queue there, I have a question for like what we as the plugin developers, you know, can actually do to make those, we are talking about the security, like how to make, but what we can actually do to make those plugins while developing it more secure? Yes, definitely. One of the things that can be done well is to kind of follow the code of conduct, for example, or like the, you know, uh, the documentation of how to use the maybe hooks in a correct way. Um, definitely sanitize the inputs, um, you know, wherever you can to do so. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, can be done well that will improve not only the security of the plugin, but also how the, you know, the users of your plugin will see um, kind of your professionality is to have like some third party security audits done once in a while, maybe once a year or so, or maybe after like every like a larger release. Um, there is service providers in the space, different ones that are actually providing code review, code review services. So this is a, something that you know, should probably be done more often, especially if you have a lot of active installations. And the other thing is like if you don't have, you know, uh, if, if, if your open source project is not generating revenue, then obviously you, know, you can't have like a lar large sum of money to pay for those security research services. Then what you can still do is set up a security program, like a managed vulnerability disclosure program, where 
you just tell the ethical hackers that, hey, if you have security issues to report, report them here. And make sure you know, that this, these issues are then going to be you know, uh, handled in an ethical way, basically. So these are like one or like two very good ways of how to do that. So I think, in general, if we kind of like put them into context, then it's all about communication, right? So communicate well to your users how the security of your plugin is covered, what you are doing as a plugin developer to make that code much more secure. Um, and also, like, if something is found and something is patched, how well you are communicating is much more important than the fact that it, there was something found in the first place. Well, thank you. We have a question from the audience there. Hey, Oliver. Great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so has there been any discussion with the plugin review team about maybe not immediately closing plugins when they have a significant uh, active installed base, but maybe taking it on and patching it and treating it more like uh, a core security issue and perhaps force pushing an update and then closing it? Yeah, I think it always happens based on a situation. So it's not always the way how, like, it's not always that they are closing it down right away. I think what they are also doing is trying to reach out to the plugin developer receiving some level of answer, you know, whether and when they are going to do that. So it's not the case that, you know, they will just, like, close it down immediately in most of the cases. Uh, but obviously, like, if there's no reaction whatsoever, then, you know, closing the plugin probably will get the reaction, uh, which will eventually get to, you know, fixing the plugin or fixing the, uh, fixing the issue that is affecting users. Um, but I think there's still a lot of work to do, right? Because we are still, you know, we are, this growth that we are seeing in terms of the vulnerabilities being fixed from the past two or three years, I mean, we are still in a very much of a baby shoes. Like, we are still, I think there's so much more security issues to still iron out. And I think as we are moving forward in this process and if the volume grows, I think we also need to have even more, you know, uh, worked out processes in terms of dealing with those security issues. So, th yeah, there's definitely work to be done there. Nice. And then the second question. Hi. Uh, I recently started experimenting with uh, WordPress blocks and downloaded a lot of blocks plugins, and they tend to lean into the JavaScript ecosystem a lot more. Um, and what I noticed is that some of these plugins have like a node modules directory with 30 to 50 dependencies. Aren't we opening up ourselves to even more dependencies by adopting these JavaScript types of working? Absolutely. The, the answer is correct. Yeah. In, I mean, it is happening because, the, and that's why I mentioned the supply chain thing, right? It's going to piggyback on top of the other things. So, and the, and the, layer, and the rabbit hole goes deeper with, you know, each level of each layer. So, uh, like, even if we see already plugins using also a lot of uh, JavaScript libraries, like even WordPress uh, core itself used like jQuery, right? And there was an issue in jQuery. So, like, these things actually go deeper and deeper and, and I think, yeah, JavaScript, as we introduce more and more JavaScript uh, into the WordPress core, I think the problem also, you know, is going to get deeper. And I mean, there's just more work to be done. Nice. We'll take the question from that side. Hi. Yeah. You talked about the way the metrics are climbing. So we went from 541 in 2020, 1,382 uh, year before last, 4,528. 99% of those are from plugins, but there's 60,000 or more plugins in the plugin repository. Like, that still seems like there's a very small number compared to the amount of code out there, and then there's obviously plugins beyond the plugin repository. Yeah. Am I right to still be alarmed that there's a lot of surface area in the plugins to still be examined? Or are you seeing a slowdown in historical vulnerabilities and now it's newly introduced vulnerabilities? Can you reassure me or should I remain alert? I think you should definitely stay alert because what we are still seeing, like we don't see any slowdown. Uh, we're definitely seeing increase even right now in this year. Uh, and I think there's, you're you know, absolutely right. There's 60,000 plugins in the ecosystem. And you know, right now, the vulnerabilities that are getting reported to us and to the other vendors in the ecosystem, these are done by you know, ethical hackers who actually look for those issues, but they you know, select, in most cases, plugins with higher you know, installation numbers, or they are looking for you know, easier kind of security vulnerabilities that you can scan the entire repo for and look for, like, for example, cross-site request forgery and stuff like that. So I think 
there's a lot more of those you know, serious security issues still hidden in those lower install count plugins. And I think that's why I was also saying that we're still in a baby shoes, like all these numbers are still like the tip of the iceberg in a way, right? And another thing to mention here is that we have almost no visibility into the premium plugins, uh, the ones that are not hosted in the WordPress.org. And these are most often much less sec checked for security issues in general. So this is another kind of you know, thing that we need to look into in the future as well. Thank you. Thanks. Nice, thank you. Your question, please. Okay, um, greetings from the other side of the Gulf of Finland. Go Estonia. Moi. Uh, yeah, moi, moi. Um, are you aware of a solution or even an initiative to set up a kind of a harness, perhaps like a DevSecOps harness for plugin developers that would contain like basic sanity things like um, vulnerability scanning, static analysis, um, things that are pretty standard on most of the other run types, or if not standards, at least there's a toolkit that you can just take into use for supply chain management, NPM audit and things like that. So are you aware of something that would help uh, plugin developers? And uh, if not, should there be something like that? I mean, thanks for asking. Our own product does kind of something like that. <laughs> but yeah, like- This was a paid advertisement. <laughs> 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 Thanks for the question. I mean, yes, uh, we, we actually do something like that as well. So we do vulnerability management and virtual patching. So we identify those vulnerabilities in your application and provide you like, you know, uh, an understanding when should you patch something, you know, what needs to be patched first before something else, what are the criticality levels, you know, how fast should you react, but also provide you that kind of like a protection before, you know, you go there and maybe update or maybe there's no update available. So it covers your uh, kind of back until uh, you can do so. And I'm sure there's other services as well, but I'm obviously not going to mention them. Okay, actually, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Leslie? Thank you for your presentation and for the ethical hacking you Thank all are you. doing. I find that example of the plugin developer who has 100,000 installs and received this notice from your team quite distressing. Uh, because I also suspect they have other plugins out there in the environment. So I wonder what other things can we be doing to put more pressure on that kind of plugin developer, including naming and shaming, putting pressure on their other plugins. Like what, what are the ethical things that you can do in your role, but that we as a community can do as well? I think instead of naming and shaming, we should just kind of focus on highlighting those who are doing better, right? So if we are talking about, like, so, for example, we, we have something called like a VDP directory. So we have a directory of all the plugins in the WordPress ecosystem who have kind of like opened up like a security program where they kind of very well say like, hey, here's how you should report security vulnerabilities to us. Here's how fast we are dealing with those issues. It's all about communication. And in terms of this com specific example as well, I think what is needed is to have like some some level of like a common understanding of how these issues should be com communicated um i don't i i never kind of believe in like naming and shaming because i feel that this is making people eventually hide from a lot of facts not to get named and shamed right uh, and i think naming and shaming is also kind of like the problem here uh why they are even like in many cases reacting negatively if they are receiving a security report because they don't want that attention on their, you know, project that, oh my God, we had a security vulnerability, right? So I think uh, what we can do is kind of just collectively talk about security issues more in a positive matter. We should talk more about like, that's great. Like we got another security issue fixed in the ecosystem. There's, you know, again, like hundreds of thousands more websites, more secure thanks to that. And we should praise the, uh, the, praise the uh, plugin developers for fixing issues transparently and openly. Um, I think that's kind of the only way to go. Nice. One more question on this side. Hello, thank you. Great talk. Thanks. So I have a question. Uh, lately, I've seen this a lot in some, especially premium plugins, that the, under the pressure of the marketing teams, these uh, authors, they just hide or even bury uh, these vulnerabilities that are reported in the change logs they, yeah. they have. So it's pretty difficult to find what actually happened and to learn from this. So how do you, you find these practices? And also, is this only like a WordPress thing or you find this also in, on a, in other uh, ecosystems? 
I, I find it more prevalent in the WordPress ecosystem, uh, not that much in the other ones where maybe the development practices are a little bit more mature and you know, uh, where a little bit more enterprise customers are using uh, the uh, frameworks. Um, but the good point that actually you brought out is that a lot of developers, in, or like not many, but in still, like we see a lot of cases where, yeah, the information is like hidden from changelog, or it's like hidden under like something like minor fix or <laughs> something super vague, right? Um, there's no point of doing that, to be honest, because what hackers do and what other security companies also do is that they monitor the SVN. We also monitor the SVN on a daily basis, so we see actually the code change diffs. We see if you have escaped something. We see if you sanitize something new on the plugin. We see if you've added nonsense. We actually see this information, and so do hackers. So even if you, find, even if you hide it from the users, actually the only ones who are going to benefit are the bad hackers. So there's really no point of doing that. That's why I'm again said like the communication is the key. And instead of kind of like trying to hide it from it or like try to kind of like, you know, stay away from the maybe bad publicity of, you know, there was a security phone, uh, issue found, I would say that the plugins that actually fix security issues in my mind are much more secure than the, those that haven't fixed any at all because I have no idea if someone has even checked, you know, uh, these plugins at all. So, so yeah, chain, hiding information in the changelog should not be done really. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, the only people you are going to eventually hide information from are those who need it the most. Thank you. Thanks. Nice, nice. Just stating the obvious, this side is killing it, guys, with a question. <laughs> Just say no. Just say no, they're killing it. So if you have more questions, there is a mic there. Thank you, <laughs> your question. Hi, uh, great talk. So basically, uh, I was just wondering, although it's uh, uh, like against the community or something like that, but still there, if uh, there can be a possibility that someone uh, like uh, WordPress can have a place where like before uploading a plugin, we, they can actually access the, like there, is there a certain level of security, you know, being maintained over there? Like that can be a good option uh, that uh, will actually check like what, uh, like uh, it should not be, you know, very, uh, that kind of a plugin which is easily hacked or something mm. like that. So uh, can it be a good thing, uh, uh, like if a community come together or either WordPress itself come together and uh, develop something like that? Actually, WordPress, uh, the Lord plugin review team does that. They do it on the first uh, submission of the plugin. If you upload a new plugin to the, to the system then they are, or to the repo, then they're actually checking the plugin for those security issues. They use, uh, I'm not actually 100% sure now, but uh, they use one of those like SAS or like a static code analyzing tools to actually check for the known issues. So they check if there's like, you know, maybe potential SQL injection vulnerabilities and stuff like that. But the thing is that after that, like after plugins start to receive or like release updates, these checks are not done anymore. So, you know, a lot of plugins that are actually applied into the repository are not at all anything similar to what they are today, right? So, um, I think there is, yeah, I think we need more tools that help plugin developers in general. Uh, and I think we need different kinds of ones. We need the ones that are for, you know, helping the community out with the communication. But we also need to have like SAS tools, for example, that they can run their plugin code through before they push a next update, for example. So you're completely right. Yeah, we definitely need that kind of tools more. Thank you. Thanks. Nice. And this side is waking up. So we have the question there. At the slide with the main vulnerabilities like uh, CSRF, XSS, SQL injections, and like most of it is handled with uh, sanitizing, escaping, and using nonces. Is there like any other major category of vulnerability that we should look out for? Is I feel like it's too easy, or is there anything more to hacking because I don't know uh, how those sites are attacked? I think a lot of the, like, like more complex ones that need more attention are definitely the ones with uh, involve broken authentication or like misuse of like WordPress existing hooks. Uh, obviously, we have a solution that you could just you know read the codex right <laughs> and you know use the use the hooks in the right way. But 
Uh, unfortunately, not everyone does so. Um, another thing to look out for is when code is actually reused, because what we've also seen is that you know um, some developers just build. You know, in WordPress we build plugins in PHP, and you know you can find a lot of PHP in you know Stack Overflow, right? Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the code on Stack Overflow is also secure. So we can see a lot of vulnerabilities being introduced in these kind of ways as well uh, into the plugins. But I think uh, the more complex ones that I think need more attention are the logic issues are surrounding uh, authentication and like how the uh, kind of like WordPress core and APIs are being uh, kind of interacted with. Um, I think these are the ones to kind of like look more uh, closely. Um, yeah. Well, and this concludes probably the longest Q&A uh, session that I ever attended. Just, you know, so many questions. That's yeah. cool. Good. That's good. Do we have any more questions? I have one, just, you know, okay. just to like to prepare. So you mentioned CloudFest. So CloudFest or WordCamp Europe, which audience do you prefer? <laughs> and big round of applause. <laughs>